thank you, uh, all of you, for being here, and Dinesh for inviting me, uh, George as provost for hosting an excellent dinner last night, and Jeff for that very kind introduction. Jeff was so kind that he didn't mention to you that on that list of space heroes, uh, I was in fact outranked by Captain Kirk, a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, you know, lest, lest anyone think that really matters. Um, however, it, it of course uh, uh, is an honor to be on any list that includes uh, Neil Armstrong, who very fortunately for the nation was ranked number one. Uh, somewhat ahead of Captain Kirk. I would, I would truly worry if it were otherwise. <laughs> so I, I was honored to be on that list. Um, my topic today is uh, one that I have been talking about it at some length, starting back when I was with NASA the last time. Uh, Jeff mentioned time with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Lab. If, if you count JPL as NASA, which we, we do, then my stint as administrator was my fourth time with NASA. So it was not a, uh, I, I guess they're done with me now. Uh, it was not a, uh, not a strange organization to me, and, and of course it was very gratifying to lead it. But uh, one of the things we do at NASA is we, we help as part of the nation's uh, leading edge engineering community to define <coughs> what constitutes great engineering. Uh, and a lot of the growth of, uh, and even indeed the creation of new engineering disciplines has been uh, in the aerospace and defense regime over the last 60 years that, that NASA has helped to pioneer. So not only did we worry about returning the space shuttle to flight and finishing the International Space Station, we also worry at the top organization level about what constitutes great engineering, and that in part is, is the context for this talk. So let me take you back 140 years to when Stevens Institute was founded. Engineering then consisted of civil engineering, which had its name uh, derived from the fact of distinguishing it for the first time starting in the early 1800s from the field of military engineering, which didn't need a name because it was all the engineering that existed. So how to lay siege to a, uh, a castle or you know how to, how to build a catapult, all that kind of stuff was from the field of, of uh, combat engineering uh, that supported uh, the Army and to a lesser extent the Navy's naval architecture was always a different thing. Civil engineering got its name because uh, as societies began to grow, the art of laying out roads and sewers and, and other things that societies would need was recognized as a, a, a separate discipline from military engineering and so got its name. Not terribly long thereafter, Mechanical engineering was established as a separate discipline. We began to have things like steam engines and more elaborate mechanisms, and, and the field grew and uh, established itself as a discipline apart from what today we would consider civil engineering. And indeed, I was just informed this morning that the first meeting of the American Society, Society of Mechanical Engineers took place on this campus. I didn't know that. It's a good day when you learn something. So, uh, so, so that's a new thing. Uh, electrical engineering, when Stevens was founded, existed but was uh, in a state that could only be described as nascent. I mean, it basically corresponded to, you know, people trying to figure out how to make uh, practical motors and, and dynamos and the field of telegraph engineering and things like that. Uh, batteries were in their infancy. Almost everything that we would recognize today as electrical engineering uh, certainly had its roots in the electrical engineering of 1870, but didn't yet exist. As far as things like that we would call almost now traditional parts of engineering, uh, aeronautical or aerospace engineering, chemical engineering, um, computer science, computer engineering, software engineering, uh, on and on and on. Uh, things that you can get PhDs in today didn't exist. Mostly weren't even thought of. Controls engineering didn't exist. The huge field of linear control theory, my, my minor in my PhD studies, uh, didn't exist. The first paper on it wasn't written until 1880 by the same Maxwell who wrote the derived Maxwell's equations. So things that are part of the fabric of everyday life 
didn't exist in engineering when this institute was founded 140 years ago. One of those things that didn't exist, that exists today and has a, even acquired a name, is systems engineering. Um, one can trace, I think, the growth of what we call today systems engineering from its roots in aerospace and defense systems development, starting with World War II and, and getting increasingly more formal, and so I'm going to say 1950 was the kind of watershed year, so maybe 60 years ago. Certainly during the decade from 1950 to 1960, we saw an incredible growth of the development of system engineering concepts and practice uh, to something recognizably like what we see today and a beginning of the understanding of the need for uh, uh, the control, the definition and, and control of, of engineering process as we develop large complex systems. When you develop, when you're trying to figure out how to, how to design and build and put into the field a B-29 or uh, a, a, an elementary intercontinental ballistic missile, something more than a traditional um, you know, head of an engineering department is required. And, and uh, the American aerospace industry pioneered it. Uh, I think it is safe to say that we owe the engineering infrastructure of what we think of as the Western democracies uh, to the growth of, of and the promulgation of and the adoption of system engineering. Uh, we would not see the large-scale air transportation, energy uh, production and distribution systems uh, any of our aerospace and defense complex, space shuttles, missions to the moon, submarines, aircraft carriers, we wouldn't see anything like what we have today without the growth uh, of system engineering. And by and large, it's been successful. But at the same time, uh, if, you, if you enjoy the works of Duke University professor Henry Petrosky, as much as I do, a civil engineer, he, uh, he writes often about the role of failure in engineering design and how it, it, we only really progress uh, through an understanding and analysis of how the last thing failed and how our next iteration is going to address that failure. And I think Dr. Petrosky is, is very much on to something and I often quote his works. <coughs> so when I look at our discipline of system engineering, and, and although I have a number of different uh, academic training areas as was mentioned. I really earned my living for most of my career, uh, for, for a very large fraction of my career, being either a system engineer or a manager of such folks. So um, if I look at the practice of the discipline, and if I take Petrosky's view of what didn't work, then I look at it and say, you know, I kind of have lost track of the number of times I have been in a failure board or received an outbrief from a failure board where somebody cites failure of system engineering. And we kind of toss that off and ignore it and move on to the next thing and say, yeah, we got to whip those guys into shape. You know, they need to follow the process. And I'm tempted to say, well, how's that been working for you? Because you keep coming up with the same failure in response to the, s in response to the same failure board analysis. Now, so uh, then I, 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 a trick I often ask myself when I'm trying to analyze a problem is if you changed the name and left the verbs alone, would you draw a different conclusion? I find that an incredibly valuable tool in critical thinking. So if I changed the name and left all the other behavior around, would I be shocked? So if I were to say, you know, in, in one failure board after another, failure of column buckling, failure to understand column buckling, failure to understand column buckling. And I kept getting that result from a failure analysis board. You know, I think I might send some people off to study column buckling, right? Um, and I might want to be motivated to do something different than what I had done before. Because what I had done before wasn't working. Well, if I then change back to system engineering and I say, do I see any different behavior? And I think, you know, there certainly are, are pockets of such thought. I'm, I'm hardly the Lone Ranger. But broadly speaking, I would say that the discipline is not remarkably changed since its origins in the 50s and the 60s. I'm motivated in that conclusion in part by my own memory, because I'm now old enough to certainly have 
grown up and I, I grew up as an engineer in, in uh, college in the, in the 60s and in an early practice in the 70s. But also um, at NASA we publish a book, uh, Readings in System Engineering, one of which is a very, very, very good paper by another former administrator of NASA by the name of Bob Frosch, who in 1969, seven years before he was named as administrator of NASA, gave a very good paper, I've now said it for the second time, um, to the IEEE talking about, uh, I even forget the title of the paper, doesn't matter, um, talking about what was wrong with system engineering. And Bob pointed out, oh so cogently in my view, that in 1969, 41 years ago, that the field had been in and become inundated with process, paper, control of process, and, and thinking about engineering in those terms, and it disgusted him. I believe that word is in the paper. He pointed out that what he saw was uh, analogous, I, I use many analogies, and Bob used one I particularly enjoy. He said the system engineering process today, this is 1969, reminds him, reminds me, reminds me, Bob, of um, somebody who is a music student who has memorized, say, the various canons of the concerto form and can tell you everything there is to know about how, what properties a concerto has, but has no actual feel for music, who then tries to write a concerto versus somebody who actually has a feel for music, knows about what a concerto sounds like, and composes one. And he says the differences are obvious uh, even to the untrained person. And he's, in my view, completely correct. So he went on to say that we have lost sight of the uh, art of engineering. And he goes on to say we have lost sight of the critical value that a system engineer should be doing, which is to oversee the development of an elegant design. And that's what he talked about. And he left it there. So I read that paper maybe five, six years ago. And uh, I, I thought Bob was really on target. And I th you know, thought more about it, continued to think about it. I'm very slow. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, you know, you can't, I, I think Bob is dead on target in one respect, in, in several. But in this one respect, he was dead on target that the true goal of the system engineering community that the practice of system engineering should be the production of designs which are elegant, quote unquote. But then you have to take it a little bit further. Um, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we've got to start asking ourselves, what do I mean by an elegant design? That's one of those words that every engineer knows, and every engineer wants to be associated with an elegant design, and yet I've not seen anyone try to define it. For example, in my own field of, of aerospace engineering, and as I put in the paper that was referenced earlier, and, and you can pick your own example from your own field, but every pilot, every aerospace engineer knows, without being told, that the DC-3 was a very elegant design. And every pilot, every aerospace engineer knows that the Ford Trimotor produced right around the same time was not ugly, clunky, noisy, inefficient, ineffective, didn't last long. The DC-3 just celebrated its 75th anniversary and is still in routine service in many parts of the world. One is clearly elegant, the other is not. Peel that onion and ask any aerospace engineer why the DC-3 is elegant and the Ford Trimotor is not and not one soul can tell you. Okay? Because we don't have a definition for what it means to be elegant even within a restricted field like aerospace engineering, never mind systems as a whole. So recognizing that, I sat around for a couple of years thinking about what might be the attributes of elegance. And I came up with four. Um, there are probably more, and as we think about them as a community, maybe we will find more. But the attributes which I thought were at least necessary, if not sufficient, um, not in any particular order, but I'll give you an order, were first, first question is, well, does it work? So I'll say effectiveness. 
it is shocking how many times we actually put into the field a system which doesn't work. Now, how does that happen? I, I mean, if I use another of my analogies, if you design a simply supported beam made out of a certain material to support a certain load between a known span, and somebody puts the beam in place, and the load gets put on and it breaks, that's a huge shock. But when we as systems engineers oversee the design, development, fabrication, integration, production of a large complex system and it goes into the field and doesn't work, nobody is surprised. In fact, that's an expectation. Okay, It has to be debugged. Uh, we spend more time and money often debugging it than we did with the original development and no one is surprised. And sometimes we get shockingly uh, bad examples of things that don't lurk, work, like um, uh, you, you um, I had an experience one time of which I'm particularly fond of remembering as I'm, I'm uh, uh, in a flight readiness review for an unmanned spacecraft, uh, a spacecraft going to, the, to Pluto, sitting on top of a rocket, and the second stage of the rocket has failed its design qualification load testing. How does that happen? And oh, by the way, the rocket is carrying a nuclear-powered payload. That was an interesting set of flight readiness <laughs> reviews. Now, we got to the end of it because we could demonstrate that, the, the payload, that, that this rocket was not going to break with that payload on this day with this flight environment. Great. Uh, try explaining that one to the Washington Post. But the point is, how, how do um, engineers in companies working with their government customers and partners get to a place where you have a payload sitting on top of a rocket which has broken under its design qual test? I mean, stop. <laughs> this is just not an acceptable practice. So the first question is, does it work? If you think it works, um, is it a hothouse flower or is it what we would call as engineers robust? Every engineer likes to use the phrase, well, I've got a robust system here, or you seek as a goal a robust design. What do you mean by that? Ask any engineer, peel that onion one more layer down, can you quantify that? Well, no, pretty much, pretty much not. Within the discipline of controls engineering, we've evolved over the last few decades the, the discipline of stochastic control where the plant parameters can vary or the inputs can vary or the operating conditions can vary and we seek to derive a control system which will still drive the, the state to the desire, the, out, the output state to the desired state. Um, but as, I, as Dinesh and I were chatting earlier today, I, I'd make the point that as broad and valuable and important as controls engineering is to our society at large today, it's still a relatively minor branch of the field of engineering writ large. And by and large, we do not have such measures of robust design uh, for, for complex systems generally. Okay, we simply don't. Um, we can tell them when we see them. Um, within the field of American aerospace engineering, uh, almost the only thing I know anything about, it was uh, visibly true that the Saturn family of rockets was quite robust. Uh, they never had a, a flight failure. They had some pretty close calls and they had some things that broke, but they never had an actual mission failure due to failure of the rocket. So it's pretty robust. Um, the same folks who designed the Saturn just a few years later designed the space shuttle. No aerospace engineer would label the space shuttle as a robust design. Now it's miraculous. It's marvelous. What it does is the stuff of science fiction a few years before. Uh, it still astounds me. But everything has to be pretty much just right or it just isn't going to work. And we've had some bad days when we found that out. So it's not what anybody would say is a robust design. What's the difference? How do I quantify that? I'm raising the question. I don't know. I think of it as a research topic. If a design works and you believe it to be robust based on whatever evidence, um, is it efficient? Does it make efficient use of the resources which go into producing it? And does it make efficient use of, of the resources which operate it? 
If I'm talking about heat engines, if I'm talking about communication theory, I have exact measures rooted in this, interestingly, in the same concept, the concept of entropy. I can have exact measures of exactly how efficient a communications channel is or a heat engine is or an energy conversion process generally. Okay, in most other fields of engineering, I don't have good measures of efficiency. And certainly, as systems engineers, where we combine inherently in our work, we are the people who combine multiple disciplines together to produce a coherent whole in, uh, in what is often a very complex arrangement of subsystems and parts. We have no measure of which I am aware that anyone would regard as accepted as a measure of an efficiency. How do I know this design is better than a design which I did not build? What was my criterion for choosing? I don't even have a measurement. Somebody's intuition? Well, that's okay, but that means that system engineering is exactly where uh, structural engineering was in the 1830s when Young's modulus existed in Thomas Young's mind and not in theoretical papers on structural engineering and, and there were no stress-strain tensors and the concepts hadn't been invented yet. Good buildings were buildings that didn't fall down. Okay, I mean literally, good buildings were buildings that didn't fall down, good bridges were bridges that didn't fall down, and good civil engineers were people who built those things even though they themselves didn't know how. Okay, and they could pass their craft on to their apprentices um, but it was like the difference between somebody who's a good pilot and somebody who's not. Um, I can fly with somebody and immediately tell you who is and who isn't, but I can't tell you how to make a bad pilot into a good one, even though I'm a flight instructor. People have different talents. Now, a large part of the growth and development of engineering as a field and the disciplines of engineering writ large is the systemization of that knowledge that some intuitive practitioners have and many, many, many others do not. We've learned how to systematize that. We haven't learned it in system engineering yet. We can identify good system engineers. We have a great deal of difficulty identifying good system engineering. Finally, if you believe your design is effective, if it's robust, if it is efficient, what does it do that you didn't want it to do? The fourth attribute of elegance I, I thought of was that a, a design should have a minimum of unintended consequences. Indeed, it's observable in practice, as opposed to the world of academia, it's observable in practice that once a system is put into fee, in the field and, and essentially debugged and does what you want it to do, that a large part of whether it has been judged retrospectively to be successful is how many band-aids do I have to put on it to keep it from doing a bunch of things I don't like? You know, we don't like our current energy uh, harvesting, transduction, distribution, storage system because it has unintended consequences of um, strip mining the land or oil spills or greenhouse gases or, or, or. It's not that we think it doesn't work, it's we don't like all the things it does that we really didn't think about, and so on. Um, we love jet engines. Jet engines have evolved over 60, 70 years uh, to be more fuel efficient and in a very, very significant way to make less noise. Because while we love jet engines, we did not at all like the noise of the early turbojets. So what does a design do that you didn't want? That's a huge criterion in determining whether it has been a successful system design. So I thought about those things and said, you know, they're kind of in common, the fact that we don't have measures for any of them. We don't have, across the disciplines of engineering writ large, we don't have measures of any of them that would allow an engineer to take system engineering beyond the stage of his or her own intuition. A good friend of mine, Gentry Lee at JPL, is a great, great, great system engineer. Another good friend of mine, Courtney Ray at APL, is a great system engineer. Why? Neither of them could begin to tell you. Okay, because we don't have measures of merit for how these things are done. We don't have grading criteria. We don't have a theory of system engineering. Moreover, it is observable 
at least it is observable to me, that different teams and groups of people produce markedly different results in response to something like the same formal set of, of statement of need or statement of requirement or job description or, or whatever. So the influence of the design team itself and no large system is the product of the individual mind. In, in today's world of engineering, it's a team sport. It's not an individual sport. So the constituency of the design team, which I think we all know, I'm just pointing it out, the constituency of the design team is a huge factor in determining what kind of outcome we produce. And yet we as engineers do not study, we do not begin to study uh, the results of uh, modern economic theory, game theory, social choice theory, um, group psychology, uh, personality inventories, all of the kinds of things that go into how our teams, our engineering teams are constituted and how they work together. Um, because we as engineers don't study those things do not mean that there are no theoretical results in those fields which might be of interest to us. We just don't know them. Okay. Um, one example that I'm fond of quoting only because it's an arch archetypal example from the theory of social choice was the uh, clinton perot bush election in 92, where President Clinton was elected despite receiving a substantial, uh, a substantial plurality, but substantially below a majority of all voters. So what kind of an election result is it when most of the people don't want the one who was elected? Well, it results from a sequence of pairwise comparisons, which Arrow's theorem published in 1950 will tell you can and often, uh, often will lead to patholo mathematically pathological results, i.e., I held an election and someone was elected who is not preferred by the majority of people who are voting. That's a mathematical pathology. It results because in our electrical process we achieve the identity, that we, we name the president, through at least two pairwise comparisons. We hold a primary and then we hold a general election. And in, an, in a situation where more than two alternatives are present, Arrow's theorem guarantee the possibility of a pathological outcome, i.e. one which would require a dictator or a decision outside the electoral process to produce a result favored by the majority. The process itself does not give you a result favored by the majority. Uh, and yet, as we watch engineering teams operate, uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I've never seen an engineering or program management team operate other than through the reaching of decisions by successions of pairwise comparisons. We compare A to B, and then we compare B to C and C to D. We work our way through to our final conclusion by evaluating this against that and moving down the design tree, which is why so very often the design team, the final decision on what the design will look like is made by the chief engineer or the leader of the team who says, okay, I've heard all that and we're going to go do this. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> is that analytically the best possible way to, to reach a decision? Can he prove that, that that was the right choice? Probably not, and I've done that a million times. I've become successful, I, w I was successful um, because my intuition was good and I was always willing to listen to somebody with a great counterargument on why I should reverse myself. But that's not a, 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 uh, that's not a formulaic path to success. So how about if we structured our design teams to operate according to different rules. Would that produce a better outcome? If we followed the results given to us by theories that come from outside engineering? Well, maybe it wouldn't, maybe it wouldn't, but we've never tried. We have no idea how such an experiment would turn out. And so when I talk about these things, I label them as questions. I, I think in academia and in advanced research and in government that what we do to advance our respective fields of endeavor and expertise and inquiry is we ask interesting questions and then we try to set up experiments and programs and, and themes of study which seek to answer those questions. 
and every bit of progress that we have across all fields of engineering today is a result of exactly that process. We've not done it for system engineering. Why? In my opinion, generally speaking, it's because the problems have not fitted in to the realm of that with which we are comfortable, meaning engineers are not comfortable looking at personality inventories as a way of structuring design teams. Moreover, Academ academic um, engineering professionals are not, generally speaking, comfortable with problems that are outside the small sphere in which they do their research. In academia, we are rewarded and we reward people for becoming silo specialists. Um, published papers are, the, are the, the currency for tenure and the currency for admission to the national academies or, or whatever honor, other honors one would wish. The ability to work across multiple disciplines in collaborative ways is not rewarded. It is neither sought nor rewarded. And yet it is the essence of system engineering. Moreover, the problems of large complex systems are things which face us in government and industry, but they are not easily tractable within the confines of the academic community working apart. So academic structural engineers can clearly understand and work with their counterparts in government and industry because each side understands what the other does. But I would assert to you from many, many years of practice that practicing system engineers have little to no notion of what goes on in the academic side of system engineering work and what goes on in the academic academic side of system engineering work has little to no practical application. Okay, real world chief system engineers, and I've been that, don't work in the way that academics think they work. Um, they may be forced to follow certain rules in order to satisfy contractual requirements, but the actual practice of the discipline bears no relationship to what is taught in academia. Now that's not a criticism of either side. It is an observation that we have not advanced what I would call the theory of system engineering because structurally our, our traditional government, industry, academic, tripartite relationship, which has done so well for us in so many fields, has stumbled over this, over this area. We do not include academics in our design teams in government and industry and we do not provide real-world problems to academics. And until and unless we start doing these things so that people whose job it is to think through the frontiers of knowledge, unless they're working on problems that are actually of interest, it's unlikely to see progress as being one of the, one of the possible outcomes. So I think we need a proactive research effort, and I, I know that uh, Dinesh agrees, I think, and, and I, I've talked to others in government who agree. I think we need a proactive effort to advance the frontiers of system engineering, to develop a theory of system engineering by looking at some of these questions and other collateral questions which others will uh, dream up and put pilot programs, research efforts in place where we can combine the, the government, industry, and academic team that has, has made the nation and, and, in fact, Western society uh, what it is today as a result of progress in other fields. But I see the future as being driven and dominated by multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary teams, not by someone's ability to put the fourth decimal place on the heat transfer coefficient of single crystal potassium. You know, that's not where the progress of our society will lie. It's important, but it's not what's going to advance us. So unless we can tackle the real problems of system engineering, we are going to continue to see failure boards report out failure of system engineering. And then we're going to say, well, we just need to put more process in place and make sure that everybody sticks with the process. And we're going to continue to fail because I'll leave you with these words and for taking your questions for about 15 minutes. If you look at what we think of as our system engineering process as, to ta as taught in, in, say, Defense Systems Management College or any of a number of, of, of entities with which I'm familiar, 
there's not one single aspect of that which goes to answering a couple of key questions. Does your process allow you to distinguish a good design from a bad design? Does your process assist you in improving a weak design? And if you can't answer those questions, then the process is necessarily incomplete. And so I suggest today that, that our society, our society of engineering professionals uh, uh, across all of our disciplines is incomplete in that sense because we don't have a theory of system engineering that allows us to answer those questions. We have people who can do it, and even they don't know why. We need to do a little better than that. So thank you very much. Then it is, by definition, the first question, right? <laughs> Second question is not about systems engineering, it's about NASA. What do you think about the future of NASA? Where do you think it should go? The first question is about systems engineering. Uh, I think you're right that uh, uh, it's a multidisciplinary field and it doesn't have a theory. I absolutely agree. But it is clear that our society's real problems are multidisciplinary. That was my point. Continue to be biology engineers, definitely. So we got to find a way to really combine fields together in a um, <coughs> accepted way, legitimate way for academia. I can tell you that there are other fields you may know that do that are doing it. Why is system engineer engineer cannot do it? For example, there is a field called system biology. These are people. It so happened that my daughter is a at uh, Harvard and she's running a lab of system biology. She's a biologist, but she has in her team 15 people, including computer scientists, mathematicians, physicists, uh, chemists, and they all work together on biology field. And that's a legitimate, accepted academic field, multidisciplinary. So there is a solution multidisciplinary. Why isn't it happening in systems engineering? I don't have the answer, but I'd like to hear yours. Well, my own, my own view um, is that, again, we don't reward within engineering academia, we don't reward young professors, grad students, researchers for doing what you said is going on in system biology. Now, they may have been driven to it because modern biology requires, to make progress, requires this integration. And I am asserting I believe that we need the same thing in system engineering. So I think we need to, again, we need to um, restate the view of what the top level goal of system engineering is. It is the production of elegant designs. And if we adopt that as our goal, then we will require this in disciplinary integration of which that you and I are both speaking, because you're reinforcing my point. Now, with regard to NASA, where is it going and where do I think it goes? Well, no one knows where it's going right now. Um, as, as I often say, uh, with $19 billion a year, you could have a, a number of different possible space programs, meaning a program that's unified by a, a roughly common goal that links the various activities of the agency. So there are far more things you could do in space then $19 billion will cover. And so you could produce a number of, of quality alternatives as to what the nation's civil space program ought to do. And that requires political choices. The question of what you ought to do is a matter of policy. Today, uh, during the last administration, as a function of the Columbia accident, um, a, a truly soul-searching process was, was uh, this is poor syntax, but we, we went through a truly soul-searching process to say what the civil space policy of the United States ought to be. And I, I mentioned a number of times that I thought it was the best policy we'd had since John Kennedy. Um, the Congress agreed twice in a row, 
uh, first led by Republicans and then led by Democrats, the Congress overwhelmingly said, yeah, that's a good policy, so that's what we'll spend our money on. A new presidential administration came to town and decided that they wanted to do something different. They didn't know what. They just knew it couldn't be anything that was done under the Bush era because Bush is evil. And we had to have a different space policy. So what they have done, on a practical basis, what has been done is to destroy a consensus that had been built up across House, bicamerally, House and Senate, and bipartisanly, Republicans and Democrats, they've torn that consensus apart and they have not yet replaced it with a consensus on what should be done. So right now we're spending money and we're not getting a result and we're not likely to. Uh, what should be, what must be done in the future, um, I, I don't know. Uh, if I knew, I sure wouldn't keep it a secret. I thought, following the Columbia accident, that we had a national recognition, a truly national recognition that NASA's fundamental purpose, reason for existence, the thing that sets it apart from other agencies, was exploring and extending the human frontier of space and learning how to exploit that. And oh yes, you get, you know, a third of the agency is science and 5% of the agency is aeronautics. You get a lot of other things when you decide you want to do, when you decide you want to explore the frontier and those are not to be sniffed at. But you could do all of NASA's science under the National Science Foundation. You don't need NASA to do that. Um, human exploration of space and extension of the human frontier is the thing which NASA does that no other agency in, in, in the nation or even in the world does. And if that is not to be done in a robust fashion, then I, don't, I personally don't know what value the agency has that's, that should cause it to be a unique agency. Um, which is not to say, I'm, I'm now often criticized for saying, well, but you don't like commercial space. I, I, I do. I deeply do. I'm the first person ever in government to put money on commercial space, hundreds of millions of dollars. I absolutely want to see it succeed. But I, I will note from history that the success of commercial aviation has not caused the government to give up military airplanes. And, and I would not like to see the analogous result in, in space. We don't have government programs because we think they're efficient. That is not the measure of merit for all things. There are things that are important for this nation to do which do not depend on whether a company makes a profit. There are things that this nation should do, that Western society should do, in my opinion, that do not depend on having a payback time of four or five years. And those things need to be done by government they need to be done well as opposed to poorly, but they are not within the realm of private industry. And so I, I, I deeply believe those things. I don't know where we're going to come out, but thanks for your question. Yes, sir. Well, yes, I, 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 get, I, I get the point, I, I do, and, and that's a very good question, but um, to quote Shakespeare, uh, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars but in ourselves that we are men. Um, the point I would make is that if, if we have led generations of engineers to believe that their engineering creation exists apart from the societal context in which it resides, we have misled them. Okay, society is muddled, it is messy, human interaction is, is complex and, and not knowable. Uh, it is difficult. But engineers create things in response to perceived problems. And if, if we are training engineers to be apart from the society in, in which they reside, then we are sending them the wrong message. Engineering is not about solving problems which are shoved under the door uh, and then, you know, you work the problem and shove the answer back out through the door. Um, 
why, uh, you know, we, we, we must constantly ask ourselves, uh, I mean, the, the, the engineers at Ford who produced the Edsel were not idiots, but the Edsel didn't sell, okay? Um, the acceptance of our engineering creations by a messy, unstructured society is a necessary feature of engineering, and to the extent that we can begin to teach in, in the larger practice of, of the profession of engineering, if we can begin to incorporate um, an understanding of, of economic the theor theory, societal values, uh, game theory, social choice theory, if we can begin to incorporate these things to understand, we may have a, a better record. It, I don't believe it will ever be perfect, but we may have a, a better ability to understand why some of our creations work well and some don't. Well, if you're specifically talking about NASA, uh, I, I, I don't know how um, executive agencies must, by law, follow the direction of the president, but also authorization law as set down by Congress. NASA was doing that. Okay, it was NASA was doing that before Columbia, and then we had a true sea change in policy, and NASA was doing it after Columbia. The societal fissure here is that a new president comes in and says, I think I'll ask NASA to do something different. Now, leaving aside the fact they haven't actually decided what yet, the key factor is, I think I'll ask them to do something different. I would observe that a new president doesn't come in and say, you know, I wonder what I'll have the Navy do in my administration. As a society, we understand what the Navy does for the United States of America. And the argument is, well, do they get a new ship in this administration or not? It's not a fundamental rethinking of what the purpose of the Navy is in American society. Okay? A new president doesn't walk in and say, you know, I, I think we need to rethink this concept of the interstate highway system. That doesn't happen, okay? The highway system that we have is certainly not perfect, and it was last rethought in the early 1950s, leading to the National Defense Highway Act and the Eisenhower administration that produced the network of interstate highways we have today. It'll probably be around for at least another 50 years before some great new idea is, is constructed. Every new president co doesn't come in and say, I wonder how we're gonna operate the national highway system in my administration. Now. So I've often asked publicly, what is it about space that causes new presidents to come in and say, you know, I think I'll have them do A instead of B. And I would observe about us aerospace engineers for very large programs and systems that you can't produce a new result in four or five years. You've got to have some consistency over a decadal span to, to get a useful result, so otherwise you're just wasting your money. Well, space is cool. So policymakers who come in from outside, whether elected or appointed by the guy who's get elected, they like to mess around in the cool stuff. So you get way, way, way more attention, trust me, as the head of NASA than you do as the head of any other $20 billion a year organization in the federal government because space is cool and they want to leave their stamp on it. And until and unless the American electorate convinces its politicians that space is an important part of our national future, our societal standing in the world, and it is not your personal playground every four years, you know, that we need to see a deliberative, thoughtful policy about what government space expenditures are going to be, but we don't decide this every four years. Until that becomes an ethos, uh, you will continue to find newly elected officials messing around with it because it's, it's cool. If we saw politicians behaving that way with the Air Force or the Marines or the Navy or the Postal Service or the highway system or the air traffic control system, they would not survive a next election. If every president who came in thought about how I'm going to restructure you know, air traffic control for, for your passenger enjoyment, there wouldn't be, that guy wouldn't hold office more than once in a row. 
but they can do it with space. And it's costing us money, and it's costing us standing in the world, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Oh, working for who? Uh, well, started with RCA and then Yep, yep, yep. I know that train of events. RCA was one of the great communication satellite builders in the world. Yeah. Which brings up one of my, uh, when you spoke about your, your four points in that, do you see a broader base engineering uh, education and then what I'll call becoming more of a gray beard to help in achieving those four points? It, it seems to me that, you know, as I've been I don't, I don't know if they're uh, becoming too young. Um, you know, possession of good ideas is, is not a respecter of age and possession of poor ideas similarly. Uh, I think there is a certain amount of experience required before you can be an effective system engineer, but in, I think it, it can vary with the individual. I think that when, you, when you're asking for my opinion, so I can only give you my opinion, when you talk about narrowness, I think that's where our problems lie. Um, in, in what you and I might both refer to as the old days, nobody got to be the whatever title you want to call it, the chief system engineer, lead system engineer, nobody got to be that without having proved themselves in at least one field of expertise and knowing a lot about other fields. Um, they were provably good or they didn't last long. Now, in, an, in, a, in a discipline not dominated by theory, that's always true, right? So I think a, 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 a benefit of developing a more elaborate theory of system engineering is that it then becomes actually teachable so people can learn it at a younger age and I think the teachable elements of it will be inherently multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary so there will be no choice except to evade narrowness, if you will. Okay, so one aspect of developing a theory is it now becomes teachable. I don't have to learn how to build buildings by sitting at the feet of a master craftsman. I can actually, I, I, I do need to sit at the feet of a master craftsman, but it can be for a shorter period of time because I have this body of theory that I can study that tells me what the end result must look something like. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm looking for to rebalance the scales. And I know Dinesh is trying to tell me I'm done, so I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate Thank your you. time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.